realmente mataron a mí. Sí. Sí. I think it's a liar. I cannot prove it. La presencia de Dios en candela. El fuego de Dios. Now it is happening. ¿Sabe qué? Lo que usted grave es esto. Usted viene a buscar escándalo acá. We have some cases of of young people. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about how wonderful I am, weren't we? <laughs> yes, we were. We were talking specifically about how your schedule. Well, we know that you do a mm. podcast on YouTube uh, at a podcast near you, and you also host um, Sean Atwood show once a week on Wednesday. What is that yeah. like? Uh, is that take up <laughs> take up a bit of your time? Uh, what, what's a day oh, in yeah. the life of Andrew Goldman? How do you get all these separate elements done? It's just, it's it's hard, you know. I'm constantly stressed. I, I even have, like, uh, fallouts with friends. Uh, not fallouts, actually, but tiffs. A little, I would say a tiff. Uh, with friends who sort of are like... I used to be the kind of guy who was on the phone all the time. I was a real, like, you know, I suppose like a stereotype of a woman from the 90s uh, from, like, a TV show, you know, always, like, on the phone, on, on the sofa, uh, gossiping and whatever. That was just how I've always been. Um, and I suppose a few friends of mine over the years have gotten used to that. But when you're just, like, I mean, every day, because I do three episodes a week now on on The Edge with Andrew Gold, on the, it's the audio podcast. Okay. One of those episodes I do take from an interview I do on Sean's uh, Wednesday night, which is the other thing I do, which I was just saying to you off air, it's a four-hour show that we do, two hours on YouTube, two hours on Patreon, on Sean Atwood's YouTube channel. And it is... Uh, it's stressful. It's stressful because it's live. That's the reason Sean wanted to get a co-host on, uh, because he couldn't do the four hours every week, you know. And I mean, the producer Ash Meikle, his job is stressful in itself because he's got to get, you know, if if it's half an hour bits in in a four hour show, that's eight guests every week. Now I get two guests a week from my own podcast, and that is hell. So getting eight and then trying to get all eight of those people to understand what it is to do a live interview, which means, you know, is your internet good enough? Because people would just call in their like car or something. And you're like, this isn't going to work. I did on so, Sean's show. I was one of those did you? people that had the pixelation <laughs> and everything, bro. And by the way, I talk with Ash, so I, I can only imagine the nightmare you two have to have to uh, deal with. That's so funny. I didn't realize that. That wasn't me having a little dig at you. I had no idea. No, no. <laughs> hey, I accept it. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, because you don't know, and like, why should you know? You know, uh, when you start, because that was you—you you hadn't started doing this stuff as much yet, right? Well, I hate to confess, Andrew, but I was about a year and a half deep, <laughs> and I, I still have a shitty internet connection. I'm using a little 720p crappy camera because, as I told you before, I can't hook up my real camera for oh, a whole yeah. bunch of reasons. I'm not going to bother to explain. That's why your I can camera relate. looks good. Uh, it looks okay. good, man. Thank you, but let's be honest. It looks shitty. I can tell you're using a DSLR camera, yeah. man. Look, mine's beautiful, but yours is. is good. And and, and there was there, there's bad you. ones, you know. There are I'll there are bad ones, and that's yours is not a bad one. It's not like pixelated and horrible, and you're not like, wah, wah, wah. you know, you look you look good. It's fine, good. honestly. Thank you. And to the audience, um, I'm going to introduce my guest here, and then we're going to get into the meat of it. But <laughs> Andrew Andrew is a very busy man, as you can tell, and he. He runs a podcast called On the Edge Podcast, which you can find on mm. YouTube and a podcast. On the Edge with Andrew Gold. Right. On the Edge with Andrew Gold. Link in the description. He <laughs> uh, is an award-winning BBC and HBO journalist, and he created this amazing documentary, which I just watched the other night, called Exorcism, The Battle for Young Minds. Speaking of the battle for young minds, Andrew, we talked about how my young mind got sucked into Scientology recently on your yeah. podcast. So I was wondering, what has been your journey? You cover extreme belief systems and cults mostly on your channel not solely but how in the heck did you get interested in in such a subject i don't really know i suppose it's a mixture of lots of things um i grew up do you know who louis theroux is or louis theroux yes yeah so he's he was a huge influence of mine and i've managed to even speak to him uh, he follows oh, really? my twitter now so which is very exciting when he started following um nice. the twitter so he's aware i don't think he's like listening to the podcast each week but he's he's aware of it and all that stuff and he's a hero of mine so i watched a lot of his stuff and i just so enjoyed it and i think over the years uh i started as you know i think you know from a jewish background and i had to go to synagogue on sundays and read about like hebrew writing and stuff like that uh, from a quite a young age, I hated it, and I really? hated. Yeah, I hated. What did I hate? I, well, I was bored, and I was seven years old, or ten years old, or twelve years old, and I did not um, want to go 
and sit in another school day on a Sunday, you know, and go in and that's how it felt to me. Um, learning all these hieroglyphics, the, the Hebrew letters and stuff, uh, not even knowing what I was saying. I just had to learn how to read it and sing. You have to sing in a certain way as well. Uh, lots of dots and weird things. They put like these mm -hmm. dots above the hieroglyphics, so you know how to sing it. And you, you know, wow. it's like these prayers and stuff. Uh, and from a young age, and I'm sure we'll get into this later or whatever, because you and I had a bit of a debate about it on my podcast, which was great. Uh, I didn't really believe in any kind of God or uh, I wasn't very spiritual. So I was just like, what am I doing here? I want to be out playing football or soccer, as you guys would say. I don't want to be in here. And, and I always remember as well, this particular moment, I must have been about 12 years old. And somebody I was, I guess I was whispering or talking in a synagogue. And someone about my age turned around to me and said, like, hey, the rabbi's talking, have some respect for the rabbi. And for whatever reason, I was very young, my head just said to me, why? I got, I got wow. no respect for this guy. Why have I got to have respect for him? Does he have respect for me? And I think respect is important. I'm not someone who doesn't think respect is important. You should, but I think respect is something that has to go both ways. It has to be voluntary. I'm not someone who's saying it has to be earned. Some people are like, it has to be earned. Well, you know, I, I think we should respect each other regardless, but it shouldn't be compelled. So that got me thinking about all kinds of extreme ideologies whereby uh, respect is somehow compelled, whether it be Scientology, you're supposed to you know, respect the leaders and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. whether it be Judaism, uh, whether it be woke culture, whatever mm -hmm. it is where you are supposed to be compelled to respect a certain set of societal laws, I didn't want to do it. So that's it, I think. Wow. You know, you had your head screwed on straight and you rebelled right at the beginning. I did the same thing too, Andrew, from zero to nine. We were Christians. That's right. You know, we would go to Sunday school, then my dad got mm. into Scientology. So I couldn't, I was just like you. I knew it was bullshit and I couldn't resist. Did your parents then not necessarily push it on you and make you follow their religion? Did you, were you given free reign by your parents to sort of think for yourself? Because in some families, as you know, the religion is pushed on it and it's not an option to kind of do what you did. Did you meet any yeah. resistance with your parents? Not so much. I think a lot of a lot of uh, any sort of Jewish people watching this who are not Orthodox or anything like that will probably relate that we were fairly secular. There was very little, probably no talk of God my entire childhood, really? and a lot of this. And I know that I know that some other, not just Jewish people, I know like some Mormons can can uh, relate to this. Certain Christians, different factions. Um, sometimes it's about keeping up appearances more than it's about God. It's right. about going to the local synagogue, or it might be a church for you or it might be whatever and like you know my mum can't suddenly turn up we only went two or three times a year by the way to like the high holy days or whatever like the new year the jewish new year but you can't my mum suddenly turns up and her kids aren't with her that's a bit like oh where are they so it's just a bit of, it was a bit of the secular cultural stuff so me rebelling against god was never a, a big deal um it was just sort of understood that there probably is a god but we don't talk about him that was sort of the amount of religion we had but me saying at 14 or 15, like, I'm not going, that was met with a lot of resistance I and bet. led to arguments and things, yeah. Did they sit you down and have a talk with you to try to get you to believe, or were you just simply, you just stuck <laughs> your guns the whole time, or what? Cause no, because be again, it, it wasn't so much about belief. It, 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 so my mum my mom never said to me, like, because God's watching, there was no, nothing oh, ever. Okay. But it was like, what do you mean you're not, you're not going to come? You know, the whole community is going to be there. And what's it going to look like if you're not here? And oh, I'm going to go and yeah. sit on your mom's going to sit on her own at the synagogue. What I is see. this about? You know, yeah, I <laughs> see that. See that that's the difference we were kind of talking about last time that I kind of make or I feel it's just my opinion, but a distinction between a religion and a cult, a cult like what I grew up and it was forced on me. It was sort of expected and I was manipulated into it. Yeah. And there's no going against L. Ron Hubbard technology. So, so that kind of formed that kind of formed then perhaps you getting involved in this, and did that lead into where did you get this bright idea to create that documentary? Which, by the way, oh, audience, yeah. I'm going to leave a link in the description box um, to Andrew's channel as well as that documentary because it's, it's quite extraordinary, especially the the twist at the end. But I don't want to give too much away. How did you just first get the idea to do that thing? Well, firstly, we can give away as much as you want. I don't mind. I don't care. People still watch it. In fact, I think they're more likely to watch it if they hear what actually happens at the end. So, right, can... we'll, we'll lead them through it, and, and I'm going to put yeah. clips and stuff too. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I, I guess it was just that disdain I had, that same feeling I had when I was 12 years old and I heard like, you got to respect the rabbi. And I had that throughout school. And, and, and I'm not saying, by the way, that that's an, that's an entirely good way of thinking. You know, I, I was- think a, it is. You protect yourself, Andrew, from, from well, bullshit. Well, yeah. You're right. You're right. But I mean, at school, it didn't always help. You know, the teachers probably looking back, the teachers wanted to teach. I'm, I'm not talking about the religious school stuff on Sunday. I'm talking about my normal school. They mm -hmm. just want to teach these kids some stuff. Right. And I was like, I'm rebelling again. I don't I like this same guy. I was just like <laughs> you, man. That's why I can't believe I fell oh. into a cult. That's a good Authority. quality, don't you think, man? Because you're, you, would you say that's because you were questioning what you were being told rather than just simply sucking in it like the rest of the students? I think it's a lot of things, isn't it? And I think that that is definitely it. I think it's rebelling, and I think that's a really important part of it. But maybe also sometimes it's just something like I was tired. I was always tired all the time at school because I didn't sleep well because most teenagers don't. And I slept a couple of our hours a night because I was playing stupid games at night and I'd go into school and I was tired. And then they're trying to teach me geography and then they're trying to teach me history. And then you got like another class and I just, my eyes were shutting. And so all I could do was like, oh, shut up, man, or something. And then I'm in detention. Yeah, it's, you want to misbehave because it's exciting. And so there's yeah. a lot to it. That, that's why I'm saying it's not only good, uh, but it is I good to you. question things, of course. But some of it was me being a selfish, spoiled brat who wanted to, you know. <laughs> and plus school isn't, the greatest fun anyways you want to be out with your mates and doing stuff stuff anyways nobody wants to be there but i even felt like i was being taught a bunch of bullshit like you said i can't i geography all that stuff bored me and i can't remember 98 percent of what i learned in school it just seemed like I, yeah i don't remember what i did yesterday you know <laughs> <laughs> well i told you you got to lay off the drugs and particularly the uh... pop, pop. But you're working on it now. <laughs> I'm working on it, man. So yes, I, I should go on to what led me to that film. So yeah. so I was like that growing up. And, and also, so that combined with, I guess I was in this sort of Jewish community. My school was not Jewish, by the way, but I had a, quite yeah. a few Jewish friends. And they just felt like, maybe it wasn't even a Jewish thing, but it just felt like the community I was in, the friends I had, a lot of it was very insular. It was very boring. It was very superficial and shallow. Northwest London can get a bit like that, I, I suppose. And a, a US equivalent might be Los Angeles, parts of parts of Los Angeles sort of this just insular superficial shallow place i f i felt and, and of course there were still very good people there. i don't want people listening going hey i'm not like that you know i get right, that right. um and that led to me wanting to sort of expand my horizons so i went and learned five languages well including english but i went to wow. learn languages and live in different countries to really understand i wanted to get as far away from like the rabbis and the boring superficial stuff and really get to learn and know cultures so i went and lived in colombia and uh, germany and and uh, France and Argentina and Brazil and, and learned the languages because I wanted to really be like a local and live the way they didn't see cool. through their eyes. Um, and I thought that was really important for journalism. You know, we talk about yeah. Brazilians or Argentinians. How can we really know them if we don't learn their languages? So that's when I came across, I was living in Argentina and on the TV, I kept seeing this like really pompous uh, exorcist. And he stood there like just telling everyone on like a morning TV talk show, like wow. make sure to watch out for like, uh, make sure you have enough pumpkins for Halloween because otherwise the devil's going to get you and just saying mad stuff like that. Wow. But people took him at face value. So that's what was crazy to me. Because it was like, this wasn't just religious TV channels. This was everywhere, like all over the wow. And then I'd hear him on the radio then. I'm in a taxi and he's on the radio and just, oh, have you had enough like olive oil in your nose? Because that will stop you getting breast cancer or whatever mad thing he was saying. Wow. And I, I had an urge to go and meet him and understand him, but also to expose some of the nonsense that he was up to. So that's how I came across it. And I was like, right, I'm making this documentary. Now, Andrew, when you go to make a documentary like that, where you're going to possibly paint them, the group in a negative light, or perhaps accidentally expose them, did you mm. find that you had to kind of manipulate them a little bit? What, how did you go about mm. keeping your intentions undercover, so to speak, to actually yeah. get them to trust you? That's a great question. And I, I think there's a lot of stuff looking back that maybe I don't feel entirely comfortable about the way I was, and yet I wouldn't change it. So it's like that cognitive dissonance. Yeah. I'm in two minds here, where if you want to make a film like that, you can't, you know, you can't email that person and say, hey, I want to make you look like a dick. Can I come over and <laughs> film you? You know, 
at the same time, you want to be like honest. You want to look right, back and say, right. hey, I was honest and I had my integrity the whole way through there. Right. So I guess the way I make that up to myself is I say to myself, hey, you know, this was a bad guy doing bad things and this was the only way to get him and to show that stuff. So I just said to him, hey, I'd like to come and film, you know, what you're, what you're doing and that I've spoken to the BBC, which I had, and they seem interested. And that was as far as it went because the BBC didn't then take the film. We had to film it ourselves, me and my friend David, and then spend two years chasing people at the BBC, just emailing random people wow. on LinkedIn, BBC addresses, wow. and saying, please watch our film, please watch it. And eventually, two years later, somebody at the BBC watched it. They took it and it won awards and things. But at the time of filming, just me and this guy David, and The Exorcist was just like, yeah, he thought this was this might go to BBC and will make him look good, I guess he thought, you know? It's a brilliant film. And the way it ends up, oh, I, I'm surprised that they didn't take it right away. They must have not gotten the emails because that that's definitely a sellable film, dude. Especially, you know, yeah. I know you had a preconceived idea, perhaps, of like, not you i don't want to get to the spoilers yet because I, I if you don't mind i'd like yeah. you know you to take us through the adventure because you literally had your life threatened dude you could not be here talking to us right now easily <laughs> as yeah. this cl clone of hypnotized people we're probably gonna murder you dude it's terrifying but so okay <laughs> so you can you take us through a little bit andrew so how did you um get the meeting with the guy and then what was sort of the first thing that kind of freaked you out or you, you know that you that caught your attention as you started this project. So I was still talking with the BBC about it potentially happening. I went back to England to have that conversation, then went back to Buenos Aires and I just went to sort of scout his place and you know check everything was okay and speak to him in person. So we didn't film the first time I met him. Mm -hmm. um, and I went and I watched him doing exorcisms. He did some sort of mass where people were, you know, throffing at the mouth, throffing at the mouth on the floor, you know, like oh, 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 doing all that stuff. Um, and I saw that, you know, some people from Agence France Press were there. I think it was them. It might have been Associated Press, but they were just taking photos and things. And that got me a bit jealous. Like, oh, God, they're all going to take my story. This is my thing. <laughs> so I had to, like, hurry up, you know. So I stopped waiting for the BBC to say yes. And I said to the exorcist, my first interaction with the exorcist, by the way, I just emailed him online. It was as simple as that. He replies, you know, he writes in a very... A godly, pious way, as if he's talking wow. in the Bible, you know, oh, that, man. oh, you know, good, good, gracious for your whatever, thank you for your blessings oh, and all God. this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I went down to, I got my friend David, who was living out in Argentina as well. He's a director and filmmaker. He's brilliant, David Hayes. And I told him about that first encounter I'd had with him. And I said, hey, calm down. Let's film this. Let's just do it. Let's stop waiting for the BBC. So he came along. I met the exorcist. And uh, they were doing a uh, an exorcism on a woman called Natalia. That's the very first part of the, the documentary. She is a, I suppose, middle-aged woman, a, bit, a little younger than that, who was feeling what she called urges and pushes, which I suppose a, a therapist with Western eyes might look at and say she was suffering from uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or some form of schizoaffective disorder disorder you know i wouldn't want to diagnose from afar but that's the kind of symptoms that that we're talking about and she had this big crazy exorcism and yeah. being a fan of louis theroux louis often takes part in the things himself and mm -hmm. i love that because it's like he's taking us there through his eyes right so i said to the exorcist beforehand his name's padre manuel can i be in you know involved in an exorcism like expecting him to say of course not this is right. you know way too important of a thing <laughs> right. we're fighting satan here right, we can't right. just have you come up. but no he was like yeah absolutely okay and he said i wow. could hold the bells and the bells you hold above the exercisees head and shake them and they apparently ward off the devil so i was stood there just shaking these bells my friend david's filming there's the exorcist and two of his like clergy or three or four maybe even uh just going berserk on the floor she's screaming it's a whole scene uh 
And at that point, actually, I realized this is probably inappropriate for me to be involved. I, I had thought this was going to be funny because exorcism to me was like, I'd only seen videos on Vice. And it's like, who are these right. silly? This is si When you're there, you're like, oh, this person's having a mental breakdown in front of me and I'm doing a silly bell ringing thing. So from that moment on in the exorcisms, I didn't take part anymore. I was just an observer on the side. But that's how it all got started, yeah. I was wondering about that because I could actually detect that uh, on the footage that you mm. did seem a little bit hesitant and you looked at your cameraman and you seemed a little weirded out by just even doing it. You didn't fully pot commit, it didn't seem like. So thanks for yeah. explaining that because I was wondering what the heck was going on in your head. Was that kind of day yeah. one, Andrew, when you just were introduced to the exorcism? Like, hi, how you doing, Padre? And then you're into the yeah. exorcism. That was day one of shooting. Yeah, day one of shooting, I'd met him on my own without shooting once, and he was pretty busy that day. He was like doing a mass, so he was like running around. He like you know shook my hand, oh hello hello, and then went off, and I just saw his mass. This was the first proper exorcism that I'd seen, wow. uh, and it was our first day of shooting. So I hardly knew the guy. I hardly knew anything what was going on or what to expect. The obviously in the documentary, it's only forty minutes long, so we have to put these things in at like one minute long or two minutes, mm -hmm. the exorcisms themselves, because otherwise you're just going to have like ages of an exorcism and you can't tell right. a story. But in real life, each exorcism, you're talking about an hour, an hour and a half of just constant. Really? So the first 20 minutes or so in the ones I've, I've seen, and I only actually mm -hmm. witnessed two, which we've got them both in a documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, the first 20 minutes or so, nothing happens. And both times I thought, oh my God, this is going to be embarrassing. This is like, you know, the, magician, the magician's trick has gone wrong just when we're filming. And then after 20, 25 minutes of just pushing and pushing and saying all these things that are going to get, you know, hip hypnotizing her, basically, hypnotizing. eventually she starts ah, like that and then wow. screaming. So, yeah. That was terrifying to watch, by the way. Now, with your study of cults and belief systems and every, you know, we've talked about this on your show. What do mm. you make of what's actually happening? Do you, what mm. do, you, do you think, can you possibly break down, just in your opinion, what's going on in those first 20 minutes? And then what happens, Andrew? Do they disassociate and then suddenly go into the trance? Like, what do you think is happening during that hour? Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think, you know, I, I doubt that any of the people being... What I would love to do is get somebody to be exercised who has never seen an exorcism before. Mm -hmm. But everyone has. You don't go to an exorcist right. unless you've seen, you know, and he played. Right. What's really interesting about exorcism is that it was quite popular about 2,000 years ago um, and then completely went out of popularity. That's what people don't really? realize. There was like no exorcism for uh, 1,500 years. There was really? very little exorcism. I mean, it happened, I think, but very rare. And the movie, The Exorcist, brought it back in a big way because it no gave shit. these kinds of, yeah, it gave these kinds of sh like shamans or whatever you'd call them, yeah. these kind of magical, independent, evangelical people. It gave them like a really cool hook. Somewhere between science and superstition, there is another world. <laughs> there are no experts. You probably know as much about possession as most priests. Look, your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She says she's the devil himself. Now, I want you to tell me that you know for a fact that there's nothing wrong with my daughter except in her mind. You tell me you know for a fact that an exorcism wouldn't do any good. You tell me that. He, in particular does not hide that. He is not shy about referencing that film. So if you go around his church, there are loads of posters of The Exorcist, the movie. No with his fucking yeah, way. With his face <laughs> superimposed Get over the, the exorcist, like the priest. People aren't yeah. going to see that that's a sham right out of... That's like having a, a picture of L. Ron Hubbard in every organization. Uh, his freaking face is superimposed on the exorcism yeah. poster. Well, not only that, but you'll have heard in the, exorc in the film we did that his mass... He plays Tubular Bells, which is the, the theme tune from The Exorcist. He plays that. Do you think that's part of the hypnosis? Be well, first of all, is it Exorcism 1 or Exorcism 3? Exorcism which 3 is, is filled with all sorts of <laughs> subliminals. It really is. Man, I was just wondering if that's part of the inducing the trance. You know, yeah. Well, well, it's you know what it is a subtle reminder to everyone who passes through right. his church. This is what an exorcism is. If you've seen the film, right. I haven't even seen the film, but I know what you know. I've seen clips of it. I've seen bits of it. If you've seen, that's how you're supposed to react once I start getting inside your head. So it is a subtle reminder, and that's well, why you're subtle. saying, yeah, exactly. Well, it is subtle <laughs> because it's the environment, right, Andrew? And it's creating this hypnosis that's probably happening when these guys are going under. So like you said, yeah. if you'd like to see somebody that hadn't had an exorcism, 
or seen or one because they yeah. wouldn't have the preconceived idea and therefore they might not accept the suggestions, right? Exactly, exactly. What is actually happening? Like, what, why do you, it, it, you, do you think that they're waiting 20 minutes? They've seen a bunch of movies on exorcism, the expectation, they know what to expect. They've seen other people do it. What do you think causes them to suddenly have that reaction that you showed on film where they go out of their mind? Mm. They're, I mean- it's- yeah, it's difficult to know, you know. I know yeah, yeah. I've seen like, you know, uh, the, the mentalist Darren Brown. Do you know Darren mm-hmm. Brown? Yeah, of course. He's amazing. He's great. I went to see him recently and he put, he brought oh, me up really? on stage. Really? Did you go under? Were you hypnotizable? No. And he found out things about me. but And I can't say too much because it's not fair to sort of reveal how it was done. But I, I saw how oh. it was done. And all I'll say is it, it was, I think there's misdirection going on. And I think he'd mm. be honest about this but there's okay so he there's so many levels to this because there's the level of the exorcist who's saying i'm magic and paranormal and then you've got darren brown who does his show he does a show called miracle where he says look i can do this stuff and i'm doing it not through god i'm i promise i you know i'm doing it because i'm doing all these tricks with your mind Mm -hmm. um and to an extent that is almost as much of a, a show the idea that he's doing these things with his mind as the exorcist is putting on because he's not doing these things with his mind. He's not, uh, there were ways that he was picking up on certain things happening on the stage with me and with other people who were brought up. There were like four of us brought up at the same time that there were explainable and I think maybe disappointing ways that he was able to find out that information. I still have Mm. no idea how he does all the tricks where I wasn't up there, but there are certain things he did where I thought, um, that's a bit of a shame. It was to do with a, st- a stage hand or it was to do with something that I had written just before, you know, and and he disguises it in a way that looks like, ah, you blinked. That's because you're thinking this and that. So that's kind of a magical thing in itself, this idea that our body behavior, I'm a bit skeptical of that. I know people on YouTube love that mm-hmm, stuff. I and know. The behavioral panel, for example, mm-hmm. and I think they're right about a lot of stuff, but it's not as... Um, you know, obvious to be able to tell these things from the way people move and stuff. I think we like that right. idea, but that's almost mm-hmm. as magical as, you know, exorcism and stuff. I've been uh, watching that l- lately too and going back and forth. I haven't made up my mind if it's pseudoscience or if there's something possibly to it. Uh, I definitely yeah. don't think it would hold up in a court, you know, and say, this guy's a psychopath because he's doing A, B, and C behavior, you know? Exactly. But they're, inter- they're interesting to watch, but they're so open to interpretation. Oh man, you know I, I I've interviewed Amanda Knox now a couple of times. She's yeah, one of my favorite I interviews. Yeah, I listen to that man. Oh, she's she's I think she's great, and every time I talk to her, I get so many people messaging angrily. You, you know, you're you're interviewing a murderer. But I, 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 into, the, I, I fall into that camp too, just to let you know. But I'm not. I'm yeah. to, to each their own. Yeah, to each their I, own. I think as well. And 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 what the only thing I'd say about it is we can't know because we weren't there. there there's so much evidence mm-hmm. to suggest that she did do it and there's so much to suggest she didn't and that's why it's yeah. so complicated so the way i am it's almost like pascal's wager uh you know pascal's wager i don't man. Yeah. i don't so pascal's wager is a reason why you should believe in god and i think it it doesn't i don't agree with the logic but the logic was like if you don't believe and god isn't real then it doesn't matter if you do believe but God isn't real, well, it doesn't really matter. If you believe and God is real, that's, wait, if you believe and God <laughs> isn't real, do you know what I mean? If you, the, the point was you should believe because if God does exist, you'll go to heaven for believing or something like that. Now, the logic right, for that so doesn't really hold up because you can't choose what you believe. That's But it that's covers all your bases, right? <laughs> that's Either it. way, ba- you've you got your bases covered. That's it. So I sort of look at a almost Pascal's wager thing of Amanda Knox or anyone else who's been accused of something. I just think like if she did do it and she murdered this woman, and I don't think people are saying she murdered. I think people say she sort of colluded or she knew more than she was that's supposed kind to. Of the vibe I got. Yeah, if that's true, and I uh, don't accuse her of it, I don't think there's that much lost. If, however, she was completely innocent. And she spent four years in prison in Italy, in not a nice prison, and had a horrific, and and death threats, and people saying, and she didn't do it, and then I'm going to go and go, yes, you did. I better be pretty damn sure. I better be really sure. I totally agree. And I was just actually watching a documentary where a guy was falsely imprisoned uh, by, uh, it's it's a long story, but there's plenty of people that are falsely imprisoned. You know, I looked into that Amanda Knox 
cursorily. I didn't check it out too much, so I, I'm no expert. I can't say if she's guilty or not. You know what? The, you know what I noticed from having this psychopath uh, interviewed on my channel. Yep. There's a disconnect and a. This is Andrew. Can I just say my opinion? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not saying this is right. It's just an opinion. She seems to me like a psychopath because there's nothing behind the eyes. Um, she seems to be very deceptive. And whether or not she did or did not do it, she could perhaps not do it. But still, to me, she seems like she laughs at inappropriate points uh, on that Joe Rogan podcast. She called the victim a bitch. She won't use her name. There's very I could go down a whole bunch of characteristics where I would think that that's actually a psychopath. But again, that's just my opinion. And I do understand what you're saying. You don't throw someone in jail. She might actually be innocent. <laughs> you know, everybody's got an opinion on YouTube. And then we also have this this thing where I interviewed uh, a dude about the Damien Eccles case, the West Memphis three. These are three people that, um, you know, Damien Eccles got let out of jail after he was, quote unquote, falsely in prison, while others, myself included, believe that he was guilty. And then there's the reverse, too, where, like you said, Andrew, you have to be so damn sure if you're going to take someone's life away. And if yeah. they, you know, I, I understand how the evidence went back and forth on the Amanda Knox thing, so much so where I, I honestly don't know if she's guilty or not. So confusing. I just feel like what, what other people would probably say about her that are a little suspicious or on the other side of the fence that maybe think she's guilty or whatever. I think what they're seeing is that a lack of truthfulness and um, a, a flat affect hmm. and something off about her. I think that's what people are seeing. Sure. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell wrote, Gladwell wrote a really good book about that, and he's just convinced she didn't do it. And he writes all about, you, you know, exposing some of the things of like, oh, but can't you see her eyes are like this? I mean, there's 7 billion humans on the planet. Right. Every single one reacts and behaves in a slightly different totally. way. Totally. Plus, given the experience she's had, wouldn't you, totally. you know? Yeah. So so I, yeah. I, I think she didn't do it. I know a lot of people think that she did that. And, and you know, it, it, again, going back to that Pascal's Wager thing, I would rather, unless they look like they're violent enough to do it again, I would rather that, um, you know, an, an innocent, I would rather that a, a guilty person gets off than an innocent person gets put in. You know, it's, it's more, totally you get what I'm saying? That, Absolutely. I would probably yeah. agree with that too. Unless, it, unless they lo someone. look... Exactly. Unless they look like they might, you know, you're talking about a big burly guy. I mean, she, she was, she's not, if she was going to do it, she's not exactly a repeat. If she did do it, she's I not exactly thinking, a repeat offender. I, I was thinking she was uh, a psychopath that set it up for other people to do it. That's the vibe I got. But again, yeah, that, well, Andrew, that's a total guess. I don't have evidence and I see, therefore I couldn't, you know, put her in jail myself because you can't just go mm. by your feelings. You have to go with the evidence and the yeah. evidence was uh, all over the place. Well, and you know what? Like, I, I, I think she, you know, like I said, I think she didn't do it. But like, mm -hmm. she's been so nice to me, really, really nice. And okay, you know, how do you know she's not saying, manipulating you? Yeah. Well, how do you know anyone's not? But you, you know what's cool? Well, okay, I, so feel like I, can, I feel like I can tell. Like, like, okay. um, I would I, if I had Amanda Knox on, for example, I would feel like I would be prepared for manipulation. Okay, so I think one thing I really liked that she did. That she that she didn't have to do, when she put out the interview she did with me on her podcast, mm -hmm. she put it out about um. I talked about, or I shouldn't say it on your YouTube because although you don't have monetization anyway, do you? No, I just I was talking about today. Well, I was talking about okay, uh, <laughs> my, like my monetizing I, anyways. But the the p word for you know p people who oh who, yeah p e d o. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, I was talking about that, and I go into that a lot because I've done a lot of interviews with those people, and I've I've done loads of research. I, I got an award last year for like the the research I did, and a lot of the stuff I say is quite controversial. And typically, mm -hmm. when people interview me about it, they it very subtly with language distance themselves from some of the more controversial things I say, just like. Andrew believes this and that, whereas, you know, that's not proven and that's not, you know, she didn't do that at all. She was brave and she faced it and she, I, I got the feeling of she is willing to take whatever, you know, uh, bad stuff that comes my way is now coming to her. Now, one reason I really liked speaking to her, one of, one of the reasons she's one of my favorite guests mm -hmm. is the same reason I've enjoyed interviewing psychopaths as well. Um, the reason I like interviewing psychopaths is because there's no pretending anymore. There's no need 
to pretend that one of us is more virtuous than the other, right. that we're more righteous. What you get sense. from them is, is is what you get. They don't need to like improve their their reputation. That guy you speak to, what was it, H.G. Tudor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's not got to prove to you, yeah, but I've got a more righteous opinion because I'm the moral one because right. he's telling you. I'm, I'm immoral. Yeah, I'm immoral. Yeah. What, what a relief to have a conversation. Most How, psychopaths I, won't, won't, don't have that self-awareness. So he is an unusual breed because he knows he's a narcissist sure. and he's very uh, introspective about that. 99% uh, of narcissists and psychopaths are not aware of that. In fact, yeah, they actually they, think that they're empathic uh, savior type people. I, I, exactly. That's where we get the cult leaders and stuff, right, Andrew? And the exorcist guy. That exorcist guy thought he was the most pious person you've ever, he's ever, you know, you were lucky to be in his presence. I think you're absolutely right about that. That Exactly. And so you get this, everybody's always trying to prove they're more empathetic than someone else. Yeah. And I've got to yeah. say, more than any, it's not just exhausting, it's you're boring. So right. you're it's so, so right, boring. Dude. We're all sitting and we're all saying the right thing about how good we are. We're humans. Yep. I want to sit yep. with people who say that they're a dick and they go, I do yes. these things. I try to be nice. I love everyone. But sometimes I do these things that are human and I'm a dick. And I want to go, yeah, me too. Oh, I try not right. to. That, that's a fun conversation. Right. I totally um, now, understand, man. Amanda Knox, I don't think, is a psychopath. However, her status, her reputation has been dragged through the mud to such an extent that she doesn't need... What's the point in trying to prove, hey, I, I do my recycling on... To Who cares? She's right, just gone to right. jail for four years. So I have that same feeling with her, and that felt like why she didn't need to distance herself from some of the stuff I was saying about those people because she doesn't care anymore about her status, about her reputation. It's been killed. And it's so enjoyable talking to people who don't care that others might say, oh, that's a bad thing you said. That's who I want to talk with forever, all those people. What would you say to the aspect where, out of respect for the victims, like I just try to put myself in her shoes. Let's say I was wrongly convicted and all that. Um, I wouldn't want to be in the spotlight trying to sell books just out of respect for the victim. I would guess I would crawl away into a corner. That's just me. What do you think about, um, is she trying to get a rep? What do you think? You said she doesn't care about mm -hmm. her reputation okay. or maybe offending the victims by speaking out. Uh, cause remember, sure. Meredith okay. Dead. Well, let's, let's, let's go with your, cause, cause you're assuming in this scenario that she didn't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. well, she's just gone to prison for four years. Why has she got to sit around saying out of respect for a victim? Now, I've been not only have I been wrongly, and, and that is the scenario, you know, I understand other people saying she did do it, but where were the scenarios she didn't do mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. So I've gone to prison for four years. My name's been dragged through the mud. Everyone hates me. They all say I'm a murderer. My life's been ruined. I've still got to keep quiet for something yeah, that I didn't that even sense. do. Like, come on, she she should be able to do whatever she wants. In that scenario, she didn't do it. She right. should be able to do whatever she wants. And I think she always had um, goals of being a journalist. And in a sense, it's unfortunate it's been taken away from her. She couldn't just climb the ranks like a normal person now. She has to come out and be Amanda yeah. Knox. But yeah. it's cool that they're making this podcast about all sorts of different things. Um, so, you know, it, look, if she did do it, then you're, you know, yeah, out of respect for the victim and all that stuff. But I, I honestly don't think she did. Do you mind if I ask you what was the clincher or what convinced you that she wasn't guilty? That Netflix documentary was quite, quite a good one. It was a really good documentary. Oh, and what's that. it? It's really interesting because the first like hour of it, it makes you think she definitely did it. So it shows you all the stuff that people are screaming about, going she did it, all that stuff. And I was like, oh my god. I'm about to interview this one because I was about oh, to interview shit. and I watched it. I was like, oh my God. And I know what you're saying about her eyes as well. Uh, she's also, you know, she, she's a very attractive as well. So you do find yourself just hooked on those eyes. Well, and they look going, dead she... to me. It doesn't look like my dad had those eyes when he came back from Scientology. Right. I, Andrew, I'm super sensitive to the eyeballs. It doesn't prove anything. I could just see there's yeah. nothing behind those eyes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, that could be nothing behind, could be that it, because it reminds you of your father, they just happen to look similar. It makes you think a similar thing for her, but she's it's a different actual person. feeling that I actually get from psychopaths and stuff. Yeah. Like I said, it doesn't hold up in court, but when you've been through what yeah. I've been through, you, you don't look at, I'm telling you, man, there's, it, there's <laughs> nothing going on. See, but, uh, not that, doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove. What about my eyes? Thing. I'm just saying I wouldn't trust her. No, your eyes look what like they have life. Your eyes look like they have life behind them. You, yeah. <laughs> Even when you try to, uh, uh, another example is Tom Cruise. If you look at Tom Cruise's eyes, he has uh, mm. you can't even fake it, Andrew, because it doesn't look real. Um, yeah. I think you're just thinking you you think blue eyes because Tom Cruise's blue eyes is oh no does he I think he does I wouldn't even know Andrew have you been uh, studying him lately too much yes. I don't know what color his eyes are Tom um, 
uh, yeah. Blue Eyes. By the way, that Netflix documentary, what's it called? I want to check that out. And so I'm not sure what it's called. I think it's just called, it's just called like the Amanda Knox. I think it's just called, yeah, he's got blue eyes, Tom Cruise. I think you've got a thing oh. with blue eyes because it reminds you of your father's eyes and uh, cold eyes. That's what it is. You know Dark eyes. eyes <laughs> Dark eyes warm. Yeah. I know. I know. So uh, yeah, Tom Cruise has got those blue eyes as well. Um, I think it's just called Amanda Knox. The, the second hour of it, it starts to f unravel how it wasn't her. And it's like, oh my God, she didn't i will definitely so, be checking that out by the way i don't trust anything on netflix because it's just basically woke propaganda but i'm but some of some of it's good so i'm going to check it out they had a there's a, a lot a, there is a lot of a lot of bad stuff on netflix you're absolutely they had right. one where they glorified ted bundy and all that and uh, yeah and also it's these netflix movies and hbo um who you were i believe a journalist for they did a whole mm. three-part series to get the west memphis three out of jail and off after they had been convicted again i don't know who's guilty or who is in that case but it's almost like these documentaries throw so much mud or um confusion into the case that sometimes yeah. they get off and well it's not it's not fun otherwise i get i'm just i'll just tell you from the from the point of view of a documentary maker mm -hmm. and and this isn't it's not what's right it's just how you feel as a documentary maker you don't want to well at least for me i don't want to go into any topic and have the same feeling when i come out of it as when i went into it so that was difficult for me with exorcism because, as you know, I have no mm -hmm. spiritual beliefs. I don't believe in God or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was so unlikely. And what I wanted to do was come out of there with something that was different. And, and I did. And the main difference was, well, firstly, this is a lot more serious than I realized. It's not mm -hmm. like some silly vice documentary where like, oh, look at these silly Mexicans. Right. This is like, you know, oh, my God, this is this is killing people. It can kill people um, just just because it could make them suicidal afterwards. It's such a big effect and everything. But the main thing I took away from it was that these people uh, actually got better. And that was really interesting for me to come out of there and go, wow, the exorcisms make people better. And that's to yeah, yeah, but but let's say a lot of the a lot of the people going to exorcisms are adolescents. Many of them are women because apparently this is what the psychiatrist told me. Like the the female adolescent brain is particularly susceptible to uh, uh, you know uh, anxieties in, in your teenage years. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of problems that someone might have. But boys as well. But a lot of them were adolescents. Now you go. A lot of people have sort of adolescent issues. I did myself. I had really of bad course. obsessive compulsive so disorder, I. right? And then you, I you get out issues. of it. I still have issues. Everybody does, dude. To this, yeah. You know, but a lot of people have them in teenage years exacerbated, Definitely. and then they sort of deal with them as adults. Now, if it works through placebo. I mean, these women were exercised and immediately better. They were like, I'm great now. I, I saw like, really? that in your film. I saw that young gal. What was, yeah. was her name? Paola? You know, Paola, Paola and uh, Candela. Sweet, vulnerable. Uh, this guy, is he a predator? Would you classify, uh, after coming out of mm. this, would you classify that as a destructive cult? Do you think that that fits that definition? And do you think he was yeah. a predatory? He was using that cult, quote unquote, to uh, <laughs> well, young yeah. women. So now we're getting towards the end of it because obviously, yeah. as you know, we sort of, I got to a point where I didn't actually say anything, but he thought I was implying that he was kissing this girl called uh, Paula, who's now his assistant, who's a woman he exercised when she was like 19. So it oh, wasn't okay. underage legally, but he's like 55, you know, right. he's a priest. He's exercising this woman who has no family. She has schizophrenia. She it's had really schizophrenia. So yeah, yeah, she was. Is he purposely going for vulnerable people, Andrew? Are those the clientele of his? Of but his those cult? who are coming to him, you know, they're people with mental health issues. They're in their adolescence. <sighs> they come from an impoverished area in the suburbs of Buenos Aires, where they don't mm -hmm. have the kind of education that they might have in the center of the city. You know, this is a really poor part of the world. Some of them do try and go to psychologists first, and that Paula girl, she lived her entire teenage years in a psychiatric ward. And then she came out and went to see the exorcist. The exorcist said, um, sorry, the I went to see her old psychiatrist oh. and he told me, we have this problem a lot that a lot of young girls are getting taken out of here. They're 18, so they're of age, they can leave. They're being taken out of here by exorcists and shamans and other kinds of religious leaders. She was by his, you know, she was exercised by him, exploited all over the internet for these mm -hmm. videos that she was in, and now seems to live upstairs in the church with him. He takes her on beach holidays and stuff like that, and it looks like they kiss each other at least on the lips. That was what the other clergy told us. I don't know what more. So I don't want to say he's a predator because 
I don't yeah, know I le legally what, what, what right. that, you know, but right. You People know. can make up their own minds after they see the yeah. film. You know, you had this interesting moment where you kind of challenged them on this being hypnosis. You said, well, what if you're mm. sitting on the couch and you were talking about oh, yeah. the adherence and you yeah. were just, you did a really good breakdown trying to talk <laughs> sense into them. What do you, this is something I always wondered about. How do you handle this, Andrew? Because I've always wondered how do you, it's impossible to talk to someone who's been brainwashed. It really is yeah. because their critical thinking is shut down. So when you were in that conversation, you were trying to explain what was happening, that they were being hypnotized and just completely dismissed you. You could see the walls going up. Do you know of any way to talk sense into people that have been brainwashed or how to get them to think critically again? Did you, And also, mm. did you run into any of that? Because you had a lot of interactions with these adherents and you would try to talk sense into them. And I could see them get so defensive where they actually finally brought you into that room. Well, what are your kind of thoughts about how to talk to people like that? Well, I, I think something I've learned and something I underestimated at the time was quite how deep these people are into right. that. So the reason that this whole thing came up, and we'll get onto that about the, the 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 padre and this girl, was because he was always with her, and there was a bit of jealousy within the clergy. Mm -hmm. So I was picking up on that, and I was asking them, and I thought, oh, they're so jealous, they're going to be on my side, so I can be a bit braver in asking right. them questions. Right. In the end, it turned out not to be the case because they all went and told him what I'd been asking and saying. So that was that was a big lesson for me. I guess I was young and now I've learned that lesson. Uh, with respect to like trying to change minds and things, I've had a lot of people on my channel um, to talk about that kind of thing. And it's really hard. It's really hard, especially when someone's been indoctrinated. And what uh, one of my guests, Peter Bogosian, says is um, he... He has this thing called street epistemology. Have you ever seen him do that? On He goes to campuses. I haven't seen him do that, but I think I know yeah. what you're talking about with the phrase street epistemology. He goes to these campuses at universities and stuff, and he'll say something like, you know, are there two sexes? Um, and he'll get people to stand on a, a line saying, very much agree, not sure. You know, there's like six lines, okay. and, and definitely not. There are more sexes and that kind of thing. And he, they go there, and I don't know exactly how it works, but he tends to start by saying to people, "How sure are you that there are many different sexes or genders? You know, that there's a multi -fl gender fluidity." And they'll say ten out of ten. And if they say ten out of ten, there's no point talking. There's just no I point. See. You know, I see. if they say nine out of ten or eight out of ten, he tends to say to them. If you're nine out of 10, what would it take to move you from nine to eight? What would you have to hear? So that's how he starts going. That's so very interesting. Maybe I should have said in that, you know, my goal, I suppose, was not to convince these this clergy. My, my goal was to just document them. So I right. wasn't really trying to change minds so much as trying right. to show that I'm, I'm doing logic here and show the camera, show the audience, the logic isn't working on these people. But if I wanted to change their mind, Maybe I could have said, how short, How much do you believe in his powers out of 10? And if they right. said 10, good luck. Nothing I can do. If they said 9 out of 10, then I might have said, okay, what can I do to bring that? What would it take for you to see or hear that would make it go down to 8? And I think that's a really interesting thing because you start thinking, if you're that person who's 9 yeah. out of 10, I wonder what it would. So then you're doing it yourself. Yeah. You know, you're it, doing the work exactly. in your head. I love that. So, it gets them to doubt. It gets them to question without you imposing your will on them. And you know what you reminded me of is that Steve has the Steve Hassan book that we talked about uh, on your show. And that yeah. was he had tools with, that would get people very similar to what you just described to get people to question by asking them certain questions. Well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? In other words, if someone's like super brainwashed, it sounds like the way to do it is to get ask questions or get them to them to change their mind because what we really want to do andrew and what i wanted to do when i got out of scientology is tell my parents how wrong they are for being scientologists mm -hmm. any kind of attack anything other than questioning getting them to question always not only was met with resistance but they went further into the cult so it never works to challenge it's people. so hard it's it, so it, hard because you want to say that too you want to just rip them out of their trance yeah and you want to just knock yeah. some sense into them but you have to use care probing questions and patience i think to i haven't deprogrammed anybody andrew I, I you know i can't even talk to my parents to even start that process because if you leave the cult you're in my cult there you're a suppressive person no more communication mm. I'm, I'm satan incarnate you know now but if you can yeah. talk to people yeah it's you, yeah 
Or to an extent, I mean, you you are maybe in a better position than most, maybe not with your own parents because you're too close, but to talk to other Scientologists. Right. One person who really left an impression on me and other of my guests on my channel was Jesse Morton, who actually passed mm -hmm. away uh, last Christmas. And I don't know I don't know why he was young. He was in his 40s, oh, but nobody's... Sad. It's really sad. But Jesse was a, a, a former terrorist. So Jesse is wow. an American who... Um, Got, went to prison and stuff. I think he had ADHD. He was like super smart, like mm -hmm. super clever. When you're talking to him, you see it. He's like, bah, 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 bah. really smart guy. And he got into prison and it just shows you could be the smartest guy in the world and you can you can get into these cults. There's, there's nothing right. stupid about being, being led into cults. And he read books and he read books in prison about Islam and the Quran mm -hmm. and all these things. And he got really, really into it. He actually was the person who came up with the ingredients for the Boston Marathon bomb. That was his recipe wow. that they used for the bomb. Wow. Um, and eventually he came away from it and he became repentant, which makes me worry about the nature of his death last year because he was very re repentant oh, wow. and guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, so I don't know, I'm speculating. And Jesse then started working for organizations to stop terrorism to sort of, you know, make amends, I suppose. And he would go and uh, speak to potential terrorists from a perspective of you're not a bad person, you're a right. good person, and I'm with you, and I understand you, and let's just chat. And it was that kind of thing instead of like, hey, you bad person, because people are just right. going to knock that back, you know? Yep. And I think he had some success with it. So That's good to hear. Um, this was a guy that you considered he was basically brainwashed in prison, right? And he took up mm. uh, these these crazy ideas and then he came to de-brainwash himself. Somehow he s snapped out of that because yeah. usually once you- I don't remember it, how. I don't uh, remember. I'd have to go back and listen. It's on my podcast and on the channel, but I can't oh, remember. Oh, I'll check that out, man. And, and listeners do, yeah. do please, because Andrew covers exactly what we cover on my channel, which is cults and extreme belief systems. Andrew, you know, we talked about um, you being an atheist on the uh, on your, you know, channel and mm -hmm. what you call a debate. I call a friendly conversation because I don't freaking know, dude. And I, I'm really curious yeah. how you see things. Did, did you could you tell me what led you like into atheism? Was that as a direct result of the because mm -hmm. you didn't grow up in an orthodox religious family? You had a certain amount of freedom. No. You could rebel. Right. And you said that that kind of planted the seeds for how you did the documentary and everything. But specifically, why atheism? Mm. So this is an interesting, and you're right. It was, I mean, to me, a debate is a friendly debate. Uh, people go to debating schools. They, it's an right, exercise. Right. It's a training exercise. So uh, right. I'm always happy to talk. And uh, so, so I think somebody commented under the video of of our interview on my channel, which is doing nicely, by the way. It's only been like a week or whatever. It's nine thousand views, which for me is Dude, is high. Really? Nine thousand yeah. views. I can't get. I can't get a thousand views on an interview. Dude, you have a I really know. high qual you have a really high quality channel too, dude. I mean, get out of here. No, you do. You got high quality <laughs> guests. I'm trying to figure out from you how to make better thumbnails and shit. Your your channel kicks out. Oh, now. good. Yeah. Well, I I learned a lot from Chris Williamson, Modern Wisdom. He's got a cool uh, YouTube channel, and I copied oh, him. Exactly. And now I wonder if I copied too much, and he might have Don't seen it, and it might have offended too much, him. Much, Andrew. I'll cut this out of the interview. This I know. No, idiot. don't. Give don't. Your I, don't. Secrets. I'm I want him to know if he ever hears. <laughs> I didn't mean. I didn't mean to copy him too Look, much. This is how you I just, get gets. You, you name just... drop it and throw it out there. Okay. You'll, you'll, have show, you'll have him on your show. You'll have him on your show. You can well, explain he, yourself. he was on my show and I was on oh, his really? and then after I asked him a lot of advice and I, I, I got the same camera as him and the same lights and the same this and, the same, and I copied his thumbnail colors and I thought, oh, I've gone too far here. But the problem was I made them blue the, and his was blue with, because faces are red and I always put a big face on a YouTube and if a face is quite red, you want to bring the saturation up so people click on it, you want the background then right, to be blue. Right, so right. so once I'd copied him, it was like, well, I can't uncopy that now because it's got to work that way and and I don't know. It might be that he's just very busy now but I, I haven't heard from him in, a, him in a while and I wonder if he's a bit offended by that That's I was trying funny. to copy too much. I doubt yeah, it, my man. Hey, if you know, I told you on Instagram, I sent you a message yesterday saying, Hey, I'm taking notes from your channels on how to do thumbnails and make it look more professional. <laughs> so everybody's getting influenced by everybody else, man. That's it. That is it. We are. We are. And that's the way to learn. It's, you know, that's what people do. People, people yeah, exactly. learn from one another. Um, but, but on that video of us, uh, yeah, there were 
some comments and things and both most people nice and lovely and stuff and but somebody said that the in their opinion the mistake or not the mistake but what they didn't agree, agree with, with what you were saying was that you see atheism as a as a choice of a, be, a belief system you said I, right yeah. go on sorry um i'm just trying to recall one, one second because i did i did kind of um interchange the belief system and what i meant by belief system andrew is anything that somebody clings to with a fervent mm. as what they call in scientology crushing certainty and it can't be moved and they're so right about their viewpoint this might be a belief in a political leader like biden or trump or uh, christianity i was talking about the the atheism that i met recently yeah. had a religious fervor that reminded me and a conviction uh, as same as say a Christian that knows I'm going to hell because I don't believe in, in the sure. Christian God. Well, those right? are, uh, we spoke about last time. Those are like I, I'm. I want you to know that that's not most atheists. Those those okay. are the ones who are commenting. Those are the ones who right, are the right. angriest because that's just how that's just how YouTube is, you know. And if you right. took a demographic of YouTube commenters, right. a lot of them are wonderful, but you're going to get the extremes there as well. Um, so point. atheism actually is is not a belief system th as far as we see it. It's mm -hmm. devoid of belief. Uh, it's show me science and I will believe. So when you say, okay. did you choose, why did you choose atheism? I didn't choose it. It's just, I haven't chosen any of the other, the actual belief systems. I haven't chosen to believe in, I you see. know, Ricky Gervais uh, has a great one. I know you're not really exactly a God believer yourself. Uh, and Ricky Gervais often says when, when people who do believe in God, he'll say to them, look, there are 4,000 gods exactly. that people believe in so how many do, how many gods do you believe in he'll say to a religious person they'll say like one and he's like right well i just believe in one fewer god than you of the four thousand gods you know both of us say no yeah. to three thousand nine hundred ninety nine of them but i say no to the other one as well so it's just that yeah and also um one of the persons left a comment on my video after we did that discussion about he he broke down it really good. He says atheism, theism was God, and A was I don't forgot what that meant. But it basically oh, said, yeah. he was basically Not. saying, look, dude, um, you know, religious believers believe in God, and we're just simply saying we don't believe, we don't have a belief in God, therefore we don't have a belief system. It made perfect sense to me. Mm. The only, uh, yeah, the, and also Andrew, you're not one of these fanatical, crazy maniac atheists. You're a really cool guy, man. So, I, and you're, and the comment section on YouTube is a whole different world. So, I hope I didn't want to, hope I didn't offend you or atheists or oh, anything because that'd be I, just ridiculous. Wanna, I just want to know, man. Um, yeah. You know that that's another thing, Andrew. Like when I got out yeah. of Scientology, the reason I I looked into the other religions, I wasn't looking for one. I just needed knowledge because I only studied Scientology, so I was stupid. So I just tried to suck up knowledge from everywhere. That's why. I, I was genuinely interested in your belief systems and how atheists, mm. how anybody sees things. So yeah. you're right. You know, I had this Christian leave a nasty comment right before we, um, we did this about, Hey, you, you know, you curse, you smoke on your videos and everything. You need to freaking find Jesus, man. I mean, you got out of Scientology, <laughs> but you haven't found Jesus. And she sounded just like a program Scientologist. I was mm. absolutely convinced. I wasn't convinced, Andrew. I knew that we had the technology and the way, to spirituality there was no doubt so i knew the moonies and christianity and all the other re you know religions and cults were stupid and that we were right so i know that a christian yeah. or a muslim they know that they're right they don't think that they're right and so yeah. everybody like you said has the same freaking god and it would seem like a universal truth would be something we can all agree on rather than create factions about who has the better god so we can all fight each other I mean, sure. you, you know, Christians forget the fact that so much war and bloodshed has been done in the name of God, in the name of religion. I call I call religion the greatest form of mind control ever invented because it it actually doesn't take people towards spirituality. It to me, it, it lessens it. But again, yeah, you, you yeah. try telling that to a believer and they'll come at you with the same kind of conviction that I have when I was brainwashed in Scientology. But they don't think yeah. that they're brainwashed. They they know that they're right. It's freaking yeah. scary, actually. Well. You know, it is. And, and I, I used to say like, yeah, without religion, we'd have a better world or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know, like, I, I think the human brain is, is so good at inventing tribalistic belief systems. Yeah. Anyway, you, you would just have a godless one, which we do. We have a uh, woke culture, we have the right. old rights, we have, you know, you have super right wing white supremacists and stuff like that. You've got super left communist Marxist, like all of these people get sucked into groups where exactly yeah. like you said, they know that even though everybody else who tried similar 
of things before didn't work out this time they're right about everything right. and you know obviously my channel we I, the whole point of my channel is to cover extreme ideologies and beliefs and cults and things and to understand why we think the ways we do one of the most fascinating uh things i remember hearing i interviewed interviewed a guy called david robson who who wrote the expectation effect but he also wrote the intelligence trap which is that mm. intelligent people the more intelligent you are you're actually more likely to fall for things like that so glad he you gives, said that i'm so glad oh, you said that because that's a myth that i'd like you to dispel with because i can back you up on yeah that. His example that he used, which I loved, was the Sherlock Holmes writer, Arthur Conan Doyle. So Sherlock Holmes is supposed to be the master of deduction, and it's so cleverly written. I haven't actually read much Sherlock Holmes, but I know how cleverly written and developed the character is. And these, so, so obviously the writer who created him is a genius. This is a genius, um, not, not just like a weird kind of genius. This is a genius in terms of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Real genius. Right, Arthur Conan Doyle believed in fairies. Right, and this was at a time when fairy belief was not not. This was not like oh, but that was back in the 1930s when everyone believed in fairies. No one believed in fairies, um, but some kids, as a prank, put up like uh, some some sort of. They took a picture of like these cardboard fairies or paper fairies. They put pins through them, stuck them onto like a wall, and they circulated that around. It became like this huge thing, and like I don't know when it was, but I'm going to say the 1920s or 30s or whenever it was. Someone will tell me when it was. And he even took the pins that that stuck them up. He took them as belly buttons and as evidence that fairies could give birth. You know, because wow. they've got belly buttons. They're not clones or anything. So it, wow. it affected him so much that he fell out with his friend Houdini, the magician, who was uh, really? an atheist. Um, at one point, um, this is so amazing, Arthur Conan Doyle's wife, I think, was a clairvoyant as well. So all this like wow. talk to the dead. So Arthur Conan Doyle's wow. wife was, was doing all this. And again, if I'm getting the story wrong, I do apologize. Anyone, anyone watching, please do correct me in the comments. This was a while ago I heard this. But Conan Doyle's wife was doing a clairvoyant thing on Houdini and saying things like, you know, uh, some, you know, lots of Christian things about the afterlife and stuff. And Houdini had to turn around and say, you know, I'm Jewish. Like this isn't relevant to me. Like she didn't even realize. And also was saying stuff about like his mom or something. It's like, my, my mum didn't die. It was something like that. The, like he, it was it was bullshit. And and Houdini and Arthur Conan Doyle fell out over it. They had a fallout. So so the the point of all that is, you know, as you say, like as we're saying, intelligent people can fall for this kind of things. So I want to get at the ideologies, and it can be one week it will be the far right, the next week it will be Scientology, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, mm -hmm. the whole spectrum, Hasidic Jews, Islam, uh, but also woke ideology. And that yeah, is the one that's that, that that's the one that gets all of the complaints. Like like ninety percent of the complaints I get and, and angry emails, and they're just as certain about just like you're saying about religion. They are so certain. I had an email last night from somebody saying there's like a million genders, and she is no, a researcher. Not. No, there yeah, isn't. well, she's like she's like a researcher. She's like an academic or so. That's how much this brain rot has infected people. And she thought I was a bigot. I tell you, Andrew, that's one of the benefits of growing up in a cult. Is it? I mean, I look at these kind of things, and they're just like Scientology. It's brainwashing. They're brainwashing our children. By the way, what makes this part of woke so disgusting is that they're grooming and teaching our children. At, when their brains are freaking forming to question their gender and their sexuality. If I was a parent, I would be an uproar over the indoctrination that's going on with kids. This is so woke bullshit. Um, that whole, that's a cult. That's an ideology. That's a brainwashing system. It's been amazing to watch it just come to the fore in the last few years. It's so insane and so illogical. Mm -hmm. There's zero critical thinking involved. What, by the way, is that just a small minority or is this, hmm. it's taking that's over the, question. the world. Yeah. That's the question. What do you I think, think it, bro? I think you know, I, I interviewed just a, a therapist called Katie Morton. She's a like, big YouTube therapist person. She's great. And I asked her a similar question, like, what's the deal? Because I want to know as well. Because, you know, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be, I'm not woke, but I just like those atheists you talked about who are like so angry, I don't want to be the anti-woke guy who's so, I want right. to put questions and I want to go, this doesn't seem right. But I also want to always be prepared for them to tell me, you know what, Andrew, you were wrong. Like, I, I, 
I'm Good. I'm welcoming that. Great point. Yeah. So great point. so I said to her, "What's the deal?" Because I always, whenever I speak to a sciency person, particularly one who isn't ideologically woke or anti woke, and she didn't seem to be, she seemed to have her head screwed on. And I was like, "Is there much to this gender dysphoria? So what's the deal?" And she was like, "Look, it's complicated, and we don't really know that much. But what she, what I would advise against is getting too angry one way or the other because it is a minority. It's like zero point zero one percent of the popular, or zero point four percent." It's a really small percentage of the population. I mean, this is something we have a lot of difficulty with because we're, human tribes are supposed to be, I mean, initially we were like 60 of us. I was reading about this the other day, evolutionary uh, psychology. There were like mm -hmm. 60 of us and the way that we were socially cohesive is we would groom each other. I know we talk about grooming kids, but groom in the sense of like, yeah, you know, cleaning each other's hair and stuff. That was social cohesion. Once we grew to like 100, 120 people as a tribe, we started inventing gossip. Gossip was like the glue that stuck us all together, right. which was just really, it just blows my mind that That's stuff. So we stopped, groom, yeah, yeah. stopped grooming, started um, the, the gossiping about each other. But what's really hard now is we're now in a, we're in a tribe of 7 billion or 8 billion mm -hmm. people. Right. So it's really hard. If you knew, if you heard how many people die in car accidents every day, you'd never get in a car again, you know, because mm -hmm. it's so many. Right. Uh, I think that was sometimes an issue with the COVID stuff. You know, you're hearing about these big numbers. And even though I was a bit skeptical, not I wasn't skeptical of COVID, but I got a bit skeptical. But then I thought, oh, God, that is rising. Oh, the numbers are rising. And it is a bit scary. And it's number, and, and that's what happens when you've got, I mean, in this country I'm in, this little island, we've got 70 million people. I mean, <laughs> That's a number you can't even imagine, right? So, right. so if you've got zero point four percent of the population might have trans or some sort of non-binary thing going on, right? Of, of seventy million, what's I don't even know what that is, but that's still tens of thousands, and they've all got internet, right? By the way, you know, I'm sure you would agree too, just to make the distinction, and so we don't, you know, give people the wrong idea. If someone really feels trans, I was just talking with my buddy about this last night. He had a a uh, guy friend that just felt like a woman his whole life. And only when he put on the bra and panties one sure. day, when he was like, he actually felt, holy shit, this is who I am. And I asked him about that. And he says, well, it could, it could be a genetic thing. You know, you might actually feel that. that I don't know if yeah. that's true. Maybe. But what I'm saying is, and another example mm. is I had an employer who really helped me out uh, when I was coming out of Scientology and I was homeless. It gave me a uh, work and I got to know him over a few years. And he was definitely gay and it was something he couldn't come out about with his family as a youngster. And I could, I could relate to that as a cult experience. He couldn't, in other words, be who we really are. So if there are people that are really gay and they feel that they're in the wrong, you know, gender, more power to him, dude. I think people should be able to do whatever the hell they want. What I, what freaks me out, Andrew, is I have this litmus test where if something is nowhere and then all of a sudden it's everywhere, it's an agenda. So when I was growing up, there was no talk about trans anything. There was no talk about any of this woke stuff. And then suddenly it just explodes everywhere. And now we have to all drop our critical thinking, question our sexuality. These seem like agendas to me. They seem like they're mm. programming and that they're put out there. Because like you said, the percentage is probably very small. But how much has it taken over the political system, the indoctrination, our schooling systems and everything? Who's, who's, fun, who's pushing well, it? Well, well, how, how much has it? And that's, that's the million dollar question. And I, think, I worry I think about quite it a bit, Andrew, because what, what I, I don't know, expert from what I'm understanding there, you know, a fair amount of schools are actually indoctrinating that woke culture to get kids to question their sexuality and all sorts of other abusive, insane things. Uh, I think that that's happening fair. I mean, what do you think? Is it just a couple schools? It just a, it's not, it's, yeah, it's yeah, being yeah. pushed in the news. I mean, I, I'm totally aware well, of it for a small minority. You know? Well, there's a couple of things. I, I, I think when you say sexuality, you mean sex, sex and gender, because sexuality yes, yes. means they might be gay or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. And my impression of that is even if you told a gay person they're straight, you tell a straight person they're gay, within 10, 15 years, that's going to go the other way around. There, were, there mm. were examples, and again, I don't know the names or anything, but there were these examples of, uh, it was a pair of twins when we talk about sex and gender, and uh, one of them was born with a, a problem with the genitals. It was a boy. And mm -hmm. so they, so the doctor decided, you know what, I've screwed this up so much, I'm just going to get rid of the penis now and just never tell them. 
and they will grow up as a girl, basically, because because male and female genitalia are sort of extensions of of one another, which which is which has blown my mind reading about that. Like like they're basically the same as a fetus, and then they start to develop in different ways. So there's, wow. you know, the, it's really weird. And then you look, wow. and you go, have a look down at yourself. You're like, oh, I suppose I can see how that happened. Oh shit, um, I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the clitoris is the penis basically, and it goes quite wow. far in to women wow. like four inches in or something like that and i just read a great book by uh, wow. jeffrey eugenides called middlesex and it's a classic but modern classic from like 10 years ago one of the best books i've ever read and it's about an intersex person and they're extremely rare but they do exist and it's a person who was basically raised as a girl um and has no sort of penis to speak of uh mm -hmm. but inside does have a lot of the male stuff and, and should have been raised as a boy anyway the historic case where they raised the person as a girl despite them being a boy, um, they got to sort of adult age and killed themselves. So, and that that's also because the doctor was abusing them sexually, the the twins. I think they both oh, may have killed themselves. Play into it. So that's it as well. That was just a mess, that whole thing. But yeah, I don't know. It's a whole complicated mess. I think, look, like anything, we probably exaggerate or or believe too much about how much it's shaping our schools and things like that. But also... It also, it's not nothing. I mean, usually these things are between the two somewhere, right? It's, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, oh, there's so much to say on that, but let me swing it back. Cause I know we've been going for a while yeah. here, Andrew, so I'll try to wrap it up, but let's swing it back to, um, mm. to the finale of the exorcism cult, because you had your yeah. life dude on the line. And since we're talking about all these extreme belief systems, uh, maybe it would have been better to be trapped in the woke ideology than what you're about to describe. So what the hell happened? Um, by, by the way, Andrew, were you kind of like trusting him the whole time? And did you have to have conversations where he had to keep testing you to make sure that because he would want to check the quality of the documentary to make sure you're not throwing him under the bus? So did you kind of have his rapport and bullshit him a little bit up until oh. a point where that reporter well turned you in? Well, the thing with that is like it, it takes so many months to edit a documentary mm -hmm. that we had we didn't even start until like a month after our last filming day with him. So there wouldn't have been much to show him. And anything we showed him, it was not like it would have my voiceover saying, oh God, I was starting to get suspicious because that didn't right. happen for another like six months. Right. So anything we show him is just going to be stuff he's seen us filming anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh, there you are. It's how you edit it, not how you film it that starts to form a narrative or a story. So we didn't have to lie. We didn't have to, you know, whatever. But he did start to, as, as we cover in the documentary, he, he starts to avoid us a little bit. I think he starts to question because some of the things i ask him i'm i'm sort of asking him tongue in cheek i'm i'm mm -hmm. joking a bit and making him look foolish i suppose i didn't feel like um, you were doing that by the way i thought you had a really <laughs> fine line and clever way of asking questions penetrating questions without coming across like an ass i thought that oh uh, i think i was a bit of an ass you think but... so man i didn't get <laughs> I was that just being like maybe that's on the editing floor because i thought i thought you asked reasonable questions and you put it in a way mm. that wasn't that sus I thought you did oh, that maybe I was. Maybe I'm hard on myself, you know. But I was. I, looking back, I, I was asking him about vampires and things like that, knowing that I think those things are silly, um, and knowing that the viewer probably does as well, you know. But he was just like, "Yeah, we see loads of vampires around here." And I was like, "Oh, yeah." So there was a bit of piss taking. But you know, if he's taking advantage of young girls, then he deserves that. I suppose. Exactly, man. I concur. <sighs> By so, the way, that yeah. part. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go on. What were you going to say? No, please, man. Finish up your finish up the question I originally asked. No, okay. Well, just just I was going to go on to that scene, like the last bit, like you know. So basically, I had been asking a lot about his relationship with this young woman called Paula, who was always with him and on holidays with him, and he, you know, this young, and <laughs> people started telling him, and at one point before this big mass of about. 10,000 people were there. Like the roads outside were closed. It was this big church nave. Yeah, it was huge because the nave of the church opened up onto the streets. So people were just flowing out. They were going down all the streets, just packed with people. They were like police cordoning off roads. This was like the event of the month in the entire region. Um, wow. And I'm like on the stage on the side with my cameraman director david and we're waiting for like something to happen we're like when's he going to come out so then this this girl or this woman paula says hey andrew do you want to come back come backstage so i'm like david come on let's go we're going backstage so i go backstage and he's there and he's like hey why don't you come in come in this room and i was like um 
okay, like David, come on. He's like, no, no, just you. This is just an, this, you've interviewed me. I'm going to interview you now. And I was like, ah, oh so my God, dude. takes me in this room. Wouldn't let David come in. So he's like outside. He's just, yeah, we, you see in the documentary, he's just put the camera down. It's still mm -hmm. filming. Uh, we never said we turned it off. And also my mic is on my lapel. Like even Thank I, God. because I'm so scared by this point, I've like forgotten. I've got the mic there. Oh, wow. You know? So uh, he's there with like clergy and like there's like six people. They're looking quite intimidating. And this is why it's important. Like we couldn't really get it across in the documentary and we couldn't, there was no way of saying, but you know, the BBC didn't know we were making this. This was me, my friend David and a young like assistant. We got to cut like an intern. We got to come along an Argentine guy who was like 18 at the time. Um, it's midnight or after midnight. It's the dangerous, impoverished suburbs of Buenos Aires. So nowhere near the center. It's like an hour to drive back to the center. Like this is like not a place where tourists or foreigners ever come. This is like oh, middle nowhere. And there's a mass of 10,000 crazy people outside. And I just thought he could kill us. He could get all these people to kill us. He could, the drop of the hat, he'd just say the word yeah. and that's the end of us. And that was really scary. I um, freaking bet, dude. I could feel it just watching you. I knew what the situation was. I didn't know there was 10,000 people. Were those 10,000 brainwashed adherents or just fans yeah. that are coming out for the event? So he has that many followers, quote unquote? Not as. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's a bit, he's, he was, at least when I was there a few years ago, he was a big deal out there. And like, wow. <sighs> I thought this was just a small little cult. It, well, maybe it wasn't 10,000. Maybe it was 5,000. It was in the That's thousands, still, though. Well, what I'm saying yeah. is, Andrew, like in the film, it just seemed like there was like five or six core people. So I got the impression mm -hmm. at the beginning it was just a few, but only at the end did I see all those people. So those yeah. are people that have gone through the exorcism that are members that believe that are schizophrenic people looking to him for help, basically. Yeah, well, a lot of them are. And a lot of them are just, you know, local believers. And that's the mm -hmm. local church as well. So okay. they, all, but they all think he's amazing. But look, you're a local wow. believer. You go to the church and every time he starts touching people in the audience and they just go blah, 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 and start talking right. in tongues. Right, foaming at right. the mouth right. so you start to believe it yourself and then you go oh you yeah. know what my nephew so-and-so has got a bit of a problem maybe i'll take him right. to see padre manuel so it's not a cult in in it's not a, it's it's sort of somewhere between a typical sort of religion and a cult so it's mm. not exactly like i'm a signed up member to the I cult see. of exorcism but I it see. is like well i go every week and i might get an exorcism and i'm gonna pay a lot of money in the gift shop for whatever you buy to cure cancer or whatever nonsense that he sells so we're in this i'm in this little room my director tries to get in and the young assistant demian who's argentine he tried to get in as well and like the the padre slams the door in his face screaming raving like a lunatic and i thought yeah yes. he's gonna kill us luckily you know and, and some of his clergy were like i'd never seen them him kiss this girl but the clergy after they're saying to me no you've misunderstood like he yes he kisses her butt you know that kind of thing and i was like oh so he does that you know <laughs> he really is kissing this girl uh we eventually like get out he screamed at us about the falkland islands and the war about us being british all this mad stuff and he just got angry and then just walked off to his mass and got on the stage in front of all the thousands of people meanwhile me and david are looking at each other like oh, oh, shit, oh my god dude. we got to get out of here now because like what's he gonna say up there and yep. he starts saying all this stuff on the microphone the uh, devil's out there. Yeah. The devil. He's referring to yeah. you, dude, while you're trying to get away. The devil's I, in the house. In this house. Oh, that's terrifying. By the so way, so scary. We we start like you can't even move in the corridors, right? So we're trying to like mm -hmm. get. There's like people all on the floor, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> I'm climbing over them all to get out. Like my heart is in my mouth. Like no, you know. So we get out, <laughs> and also before up till then we'd been coming in the days and we've been getting a train back to buenos aires right but this is like his midnight mass mm -hmm. so we're like you know the church were going to call us a, a taxi from buenos aires to come out from some sort of private company but like that didn't happen so we're like how the hell are we getting home? this is a really scary area to be walking around with like huge big cameras and yeah, big english accents equipment at the very least man oh so we were really scared we're walking for a bit and then david the director he says to me when I was just, when we were just leaving just now, because he was filming me from behind leaving, you got to show me leaving. He says like the cap was on the camera. So we didn't get it. And I'm like, oh man, well, we're just going to have to leave. And he was like, mm, we're not, we can't leave. We can't we'll leave because director, you know, that's important to them. Yep. That's so important to him. 
And I'm like, no. And he's like, we've got to go back in. I was like, David, we're no, not going back in. Fuck no, that. Back in. And he's pushing and pushing about it. And so we go back in. We go Dude. round the side Ooh. while the exorcist is like spraying people with water and like he's going mad about the devil. That's oh, when we heard all that stuff. Satan is in the house. If you oh, see him, this and that. God. We're creeping around the side over people to go back to this room we had been in just because crazy. you need this stuff for the film. And then David's <laughs> behind me, gets the camera out, shoots me again, walking over everyone, trying to sort of get past. And sc and we got it. Luckily, we got <laughs> out. We walked for ages found like a taxi that we thought you know this guy could kill us who's this guy yeah luckily he did drive us back to buenos aires and i was shaking for like oh, days Andrew, i don't freaking blame you i'm surprised you didn't walk away with ptsd after that that's freaking terrifying it's so scary could have taken your life or had the mob jump on you yeah that's what we thought hey, man i'm but glad it was you only... got out of that and got that footage oh. it's amazing footage dude I mean... <laughs> thank you well look i just say we didn't you know because i forgot the microphone was on i wasn't thinking about the film anymore uh when we were in the taxi on the way back we were both obviously as you do you know we're going what the hell was wrong with that guy what of oh my god what a lunatic that was insane and i was upset because i thought i wanted to have a few more interviews with him and it's like mm -hmm. well, we're not going back to that church uh and it was only as we started talking about it we started to realize like you know by the time we got back to buenos aires in that sort of hour we were like oh my god did we get all of was the film still running did my microphone we that wasn't we've just filmed the most insane thing i've ever seen yeah. we've got it all recorded that's even better maybe that's going to yeah. work but like, oh my god i can't wait to see the footage and then the next few months starting to put it together and listening going god did you hear this crazy thing he said look listen to this and we're like it was so exciting then and we knew we had something and, and you know then it ends up bbc at one festival awards that's and, and awesome. probably because because you flipped out like a lunatic yeah. And by the way, that allowed you to expose it as the destructive. I know it's not a co I, I get the point you're making earlier, but let's just say it's a destructive group. He yeah. would have never shown his true colors uh, if that didn't happen. Cause you know, yeah. and that definitely made for a better film. All right. In oh, conclusion, yeah. my man, um, could you, um, you know, you, you talked earlier about you went in with perhaps a preconceived idea or a certain idea who the hell couldn't going into exorcism. What are some of the lessons that you learned out of maybe not just the exorcism film and, you know, documentary film, but just talking with uh, ex-cult members like me and extreme belief systems in general? How did your viewpoint mm. kind of, if any, shifted since since then? Um, well, I mean, just uh, a lot of the stuff, I just, I would just reiterate some of the stuff I've said. So I would firstly say exorcism does work. Oh, I suppose I didn't finish that point. Like what I was going to say with that was that if you're an adolescent who's probably in the final year or the final six months of that time when you've got a mental illness and then exorcism via placebo helps yeah. you sort of for those six to 12 months, you're basically cured. So that was really fascinating to look at and the power of placebo. And I've looked into that a lot mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, placebo can make people with Parkinson's for example if you give them placebo their conditions can get better their mm -hmm. symptoms uh, are alleviated and, and the brain actually produces dopamine upon the placebo pill yeah whatever. incredible yeah. So I would say that, and I would say with regards to cults in general, what I was saying before of just, it's nothing to do with your intelligence one way or the other. I mean, it, you could be really stupid, you could be really smart, and, and if you're in the wrong place, wrong time, wrong kind of experiences, you can get sucked into stuff. And the final thing is, again, what I would say is the cults are not just Scientology and Jehovah's Witnesses. I had a great interview on my podcast and YouTube channel with Amanda Montel, who talks about the language of cults and things like that. That was excellent. And Excellent, by the way. I oh, that. thank you. She's great. And look, She's everyone disagrees. Super articulate. Yeah. Really good. Everyone yeah. disagrees about um, um, this, which is like some people say a cult has to be a very specific thing. But some people like her, they say, well, yes, but you could say that a, a football team is a cult, that a gym membership is a cult. And they all exhibit little things that are a little bit cultish. And her, what she said at the end, it was the best advice that I've heard about that, which was uh, instead of worrying if you're in a cult, has my, you know, what are the ones that uh, Jumba Juice or uh, some of those fitness ones can get really culty, mm -hmm. you know, a woke Definitely. or this or that. She said, instead of saying, God, am I in a cult? I have to leave it and that stuff. She said, join many cults. So you've got like five of them or 10 of them and they all sort of contradict each other. And that means right. if one of them falls apart then you've got the other ones to fall back on, which means that one of the reasons people don't leave cults is because they're so worried. That's all I have. If I leave mm -hmm. this, I've Definitely. got nothing. Well, exactly. if you've got loads of them, you're fine. So I, I love that. So that's what I would probably want to leave this leave this interview on. I like that on that note. That's freaking yeah. excellent, dude. 
Um, Andrew, where can people find you at? On the Edge with Andrew Gold YouTube channel. Um, most people are watch be watching on YouTube anyway. So yeah, click over. I love when people come and say, "Oh, I came from Dazed but Not Confused." I came from Doug's show. Come and say that. I love that, and, and cool. I'll tell Doug as well. Doug Very will cool. get a new pair of wings for every oh, time you come you, and do it. That's cool. <laughs> hey, man, dude, I really yeah. appreciate you taking the time to come on and speak with me, man. It's been oh, very informative, educational. I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you having me on. We'll have to do it again sometime. You know? I'd love if to. You, I'd love to. If you want as well, I'll put I'll put this out maybe a week later or something on my own channel and maybe get Absolutely. people over to yours. Whenever you'd like to put it out, you can put it out. Oh, Please thanks, do. You know, the more people that see it, the better. That's what the I more think people as well. Because um, you, you're, you're doing a, a service. You know? You're trying to explain to people about destructive cults. I, can I say one thing, by the way, that you triggered off by what you yeah. just – your summation – um, you know, we were talking about Steve Hassan and then how do you know if you're in a cult? Well, it's like a spectrum too. I would say it's a spectrum. And then there's also certain characteristics that make it a destructive cult. So that's kind of the difference. Yeah. Like with Scientology, is it requiring 100%. a full-time commitment? Are you having to pay money to go up secret levels? And then something that you're just really into, well, it could be really all immersive and everything, but they're not charging money. It's something you're into. And also the key is it's not destructive. It's not taking you away from your family. You're not spending millions of dollars, to, you know, so you can be obsessive, I think, about a group. And uh, again, I, I, I can't help but plug that book because it's the one that woke me up and it just gives a really, you know, good, good view of like that spectrum. Yeah. Again, man, keep doing what you're doing and exposing cults because I mean, I'm into the same thing. And uh, the world itself is getting more and more intense. So the more people that can think critically, the better, man.